welcome to the Creative Constitution podcast. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest, Ben Pfeiffer, um, who is going to be talking to us about the topic of resourcefulness. Hello, Ben. Hi, Deb. How are you? Good. It's so nice to have you on the podcast. I'm super pumped. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. So you're an actor, director, a bit of everything, really. So I'd love to know a little bit more about your journey and how it all started. Yeah, sure. I couldn't quite tell you if... I, I love all aspects of being an artist, but I couldn't quite tell you if I'm doing acting, directing and writing out of necessity or out of, uh, you know, I enjoy them. I love them all. You get <laughs> uh, a different sense of satisfaction from each of them. Yeah. And I do feel like tapping into one area enriches your appreciation and understanding of another. Yeah. So true. Yeah. Where did it all start for you? Oh, gosh. Uh, so it started for me, uh, I grew up in Wollongong, um, so 90 minutes south of Sydney. And Wollongong actually has a really rich community theatre scene. Mm. Um, I was very fortunate to begin acting, training, or drama at that stage. Yeah. <laughs> no one trains a five-year-old. Um, <laughs> at the Performing Arts Centre, I trained with Janet Shaw, mm. who, who ran the drama studio there. She was uh, a NIDA graduate from a while back. And, uh, yeah, that's where it started for me. Um, my mum always tells me that when I was three, I did inform her that I was going to be a performer, <laughs> which is, you know, <laughs> yep. Um, I don't know where that came from. Uh, I'm definitely the black sheep within my uh, sibling yeah. Uh, set up, youngest of four. Um, Are they creative yeah. as well? They're not creative at all. So my, my older sister is a nurse and then my brother is a finance lawyer mm. and then my next sister is in property development and marketing management and then there was me. Well, what went right with you, am I right? <laughs> I, have, I have no idea, no idea, but it was just kind of there from the beginning. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, so you started really just training as an actor. That was sort of the, the path that you were on. And then yeah. I would imagine you found yourself, as most actors do, sort of looking for different roles. And that's when you started really putting things into your own hands. Yeah. And I think, I think for me, um, growing up queer in remote Australia in the 80s and 90s, um, Creativity and drama and performance enabled me to escape some of the more mm. dark aspects of society. I yeah. could I could transform, I could be someone else for a period of time. And, you know, as all actors say, you learn things from the productions and the roles that you play. Yeah. Um, so it really became a safe space for me and uh, a platform for personal and creative expression um and you know I was really fortunate to have the teachers that I had throughout my very very early years and mm. um like when I went to high school I did actually uh, go to a performing arts high school so again the kind of quality and uh standard w was pretty high and mm. um but then later in high school, I was a member of the New South Wales State Drama Company. So again, I just I just was really fortunate to have access to, you know, a lot of extraordinary yeah. teachers and people who could teach really techniques mold and you. skills. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like to have the skills that you'd need to get to those bigger echelons. Yeah, did yeah. You, did you stay in your hometown for long, or did did you sort of escape to the big city in in that pursuit of that dream pretty I did, quickly? I did get out as as quickly as I could. I didn't go to university straight out of high school. I waited until I was twenty three. So mm. I I got a really great acting gig um, touring Australia for the first year out of high school. Amazing. That was a great experience and I saved some money and did a bunch of theatre and then my brother at the time was living in New York. I think that was 2002. He was getting married, so I ended up doing a round-world trip. And then I came home, lived in Sydney for a year, did a, uh, a part-time acting course, auditioned for VCA, and then 2005 rolled around and that's when I moved to Melbourne and 
It's interesting. There, were t- there was a sort of fork in the road for me. It was either music theatre at WAPA or acting at VCA. Mm. Um, and I, I feel incredibly fortunate that I ended up going with VCA because it has completely shaped the work that I do now and mm. my, my worldview entirely. How so? Give me some details. <clears throat> uh, all of the work that I create as a theatre practitioner, um, as a writer, is always embedded and informed by either a social justice issue or something that has touched me in some way that I want to bring awareness to. Um, Mm. So with this project that I've done, particularly with my theatre company, The Artists and Collective, there has been focused, for example, uh, suicide and youth. Yeah. Um, so we did a production of Pains of Youth at the Malt House and for that particular one we aligned with Beyond Blue and we had some post-show chats and, you know, raised some money for um, to give to the charity. Um, yeah. yeah. It's, um, it, it's, uh, it's about creating work that um, enables conversation. Mm. Create platforms where people can start to talk about things that may feel uncomfortable or taboo or, yeah, might be triggering. Yeah. Um, so that's, I would say that's how it's shaped me, but also the, the subtitle of the course when I was at VCA is, it's Bachelor of Dramatic Art, but it was The Autonomous Artist. Mm. So it was a really holistic approach to how to work in the industry and it really equipped us to make our own work. Yeah. Um, I mean, the original notion behind VCA is that each graduating company would literally create a theatre company and they would go on to work together. Um, That's fantastic. Which was a beautiful notion, but the, the, the idea died off. But interestingly, I think that is what actually led to Melbourne having such an incredibly rich and interesting and diverse uh, independent theatre scene. Mm. Yeah. Well, as an actor, I mean, I've gone through different training courses and workshops, and one of the biggest takeaways that they always end sort of their, their courses with is go and make your own work, make your own opportunities. And I think as someone that hasn't always done acting and has a bit of a background in business and figuring that stuff out, I sort of knew straight away that you had to do that because of the supply demand issue that is in the acting industry and film. Yeah. And just in general, there's always more people vying for the same jobs. So Absolutely. I think that's fantastic that they really ingrained that in you. But one of the biggest things I think that stops a lot of people from making their own work is like, where do they start? So I'd love to know how you did that. And how you sort of took that leap. Yeah. Um, I think it's all about scale um, and using what you immediately have access to. Mm. Um, If all you can afford is, you know, a bar stool that you find in council cleanup and an empty church hall and one single spotlight. Yeah. Use that. Mm. Um. I've always found that embracing the limitations of what you're working with leads to interesting outcomes. Um, Like resourcefulness is something that's embedded in me. So I'm the youngest of four, but there's huge age gaps. So my siblings are 58, 57, and then my other sister's 45, and then I'm 42. Yeah, wow. And so my parents were always much older um, my dad was born in 1939 and my mum in 1944. Wow. Um, so they both lived through and post World War II. Um, and that had completely shaped the way that they approach life. My mum has this extraordinary ability to kind of pick up anything and turn it into something beautiful. Like she would make all of our clothes when I was younger. We mm. were we were pretty poor, um, but I would go into the shop and show her what I wanted and she would try and replicate it as best she could. Oh, that's um, amazing. So that I felt on brand. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um, and my father was a, a carpenter and builder. 
So they would always keep things around the house. We had this enormous garage that was the entire bottom story of our house. And it was always just chock-a-block full of bits and pieces that were found and, and kept for, you know, some sort of future possible use. Yeah. Um, so these things were reimagined and reused down the track. Um, uh, we always went op shopping with my mum and she would, you know, mend things or take them in or let the hem down or we'd dye them or anything like that. So yeah. that kind of post-World War II kind of a resourceful and kind of inventive approach. It's, it's mm. lateral thinking. It's problem solving. All of that completely and utterly informed my um, approach to creating work. Um, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. I always uh, remember, like, my mom is so good at sewing and doing all these things. Like, she could she could patch up anything, whereas I feel like, my generation we just don't really know how to do that stuff so you, you lose a bit of that resourcefulness and yeah. um, I personally find that like if if I need something done like a costume or whatever sometimes you can find additional resources pretty easily like Facebook's been an amazing tool for me personally to find people that have way better skills than I do because it is also like a limitation to how much you can personally learn and the time investment then you can that you can put into something so there's Absolutely. that. There's that too. But yeah, our, my parents were so much more, more resourceful. You could take a lot from that. Your dad would have been great for production design, putting together he actually, like little he, he did pieces. build some things for productions when I was younger. So yeah, there that you was go. Great. Um, but it's it's actually beautiful, and it's like a it's a green approach to making work, um, which you know is a huge conversation point now. How can we look after you know, this amazing planet that we've been gifted and yeah. make work without uh, hurting the planet. Um, I was actually thinking, so back to your question about how did I start? The first production that I directed as part of the Artisan Collective, I directed and I also acted in it and I also did the production design and the sound design. Um, so... The entire set was uh, council cleanup. Wow. And so I, you know, just kept throwing things in the back of my car and, and built this incredible kind of eclectic, interesting creation that had I been given a budget of, you know, $20,000 to build a set, it, it wouldn't have had the same sense of story yeah, the personality and, as well. and uniqueness. And, yeah, like I was saying before, these are the things that can – uh, lead to interesting outcomes if you do yeah. embrace the limitations. Um, yeah. hundred percent. I think the same is true with story. Um, so when you're writing something, you mentioned earlier that you like to, to sort of use the same sort of topics, like almost like a genre or, or like a, almost like a, a theme in itself. And I'm sort of wondering like, where did that come from? Like, you know, cause you could have been making horror films or, <laughs> or comedy movies, like why that? Where was the, the attraction to go for those more sensitive stories? I think for me it's um, about wanting to be an artist of integrity. Mm -hmm. um, that very kind of simple notion of theatre and film being a mirror to society and, like I said before, um, creating platforms for conversation. Mm. I wouldn't want to make empty work. It has to have like a heartstring stitched into the story for me to be able to keep going, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise it's very, uh, it can feel very vacuous and empty. Um, and it gives you incredible agency if you're making work that feels important to you. I mean, and even talking about resourcefulness, like using yourself as a resource, um, conversations now in the industry about who has ownership to tell certain stories, mm. um, who has agency, um, they're really important conversations. So I think starting with yourself, your experience your worldviews, um, 
things that tweak your interest are very, very likely to also tweak the interest of others. Um, I think I learned the hard way. So the, the returned, the production that I'm heading into in January, that is my fifth feature film. And I think I learned a hard lesson in scale. Mm. So the first uh, feature film that I wrote was in 2015 and that one ended up getting optioned and we had funding from um, Vic Screen and Screen Australia and it went on for years and years and it was epic in proportion and scale. Wow. Um, And it was kind of thwarted by COVID, that particular production, but... Um, one aspect of the story was taken from my own lived experience and the other wasn't. Um, and so very, very slowly as I wrote each screenplay following that one, I kept sort of whittling down to the bare essentials of something that I knew I could tell with authority and authenticity. Mm. And so then I arrived at The Returned. Um, and so that was... It was drawn from observations of my siblings uh, as we witnessed my my father dying over um, 18 months in the end. I'm Um, sorry to hear. Thank you. Um, So I was in first year VCA and both of my parents had a cancer scare within two days of each other. And at that point in their lives, they'd been divorced and hadn't really spoken for 10 years. Mm. Um, My mum had a lump removed and she ended up being okay in the end, but my father had mesothelioma, which is asbestos cancer. Oh, no. Um, And at that stage, he was given four weeks to live. And so I left uni and I went home for four weeks and he didn't die. (laughs) So I had to go back to uni and say, so sorry. Um, this is, you know, going to keep going. So it ended up going on for another 12 months, I think. Um, but yeah, I, did, I was just observing my siblings and their completely different approaches to grief, like the mm. default kind of, the defaults and tendencies that they just naturally leaned on to be able to survive this. Um, yeah. But towards the end of his life, I remember reflecting on mum's um, cancer scare and I was looking at these two very different grief journeys because my relationship with both of my parents was completely different. Mm. And um, I knew that the journey with my mum is one that I could move through with peace and grace and I would understand my grief, whereas the journey with my dad would be much more complex. And so that is kind of the seed of... Um, the returned, um, looking at, at my siblings and all of that. Uh, wow. Yeah. So that's, that, that was the kind of, that was my, that's my example of, I, I suppose, using self as source um, and, yeah, telling a story that I, you know, had lived experience of. Well, they say to write what you know. So I think that's a, that's a perfect example. And um, I find it easier too. Like I actually never intended to write scripts. And then I sort of got to a point where I was like, well, I've sort of got these really cool ideas for films that I'd like to do. And and, and no one's going to write it for me or, or, you know, they want money or whatever, or they might want to change the vision or the idea that I've got. And so sort of how you were saying at the start of this episode, out of necessity, I had to learn to screenwrite. And so then I started doing it. And I, and I don't know if you feel like the same, but sort of the more I started to study screenwriting, the less it flowed for me. Did you find that too, by any chance? I, kn- I know what you mean. So my, my partner is studied at VCA Film and TV. So he's an incredibly skilled and highly awarded screenwriter. So I'm lucky that I just sort of leached all the information from him. (laughs) So I never actually studied formally. Um, I just kind of dove in and I think that my 30 years prior to that of acting experience is what Mm. enabled me to sort of tell stories. So I was learning a lot on the fly. But 
Yeah, I, th- I, I, I totally get what you mean because I think just just write something. Um, often I find the kind of the rules around screenwriting a little yeah, they're like too rigid. Boring. I don't like yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, break like, the rules. Yeah, it's like the character names need to be in capitals, and like you, you don't you don't say too much in the descriptions. It's too much. I'm just like, ugh. I sort of just like, I sort of just want to write and then um, just make the damn thing. Like I feel yeah. like there are too many when when there are too many rules and too many sort of like people in your ear, you just sort of stop. Like, and I'm sure you probably experienced the same thing where like you have this grand idea, it's a little speckle in your brain, you start developing it and then you, you hear something, um, from someone else or someone reads your script and they're like, Ooh, I don't know about that. And all of a sudden that little twinkle disappears. And I feel like sometimes the best work comes out of rapid sort of like get it done. I absolutely agree. And I think that the first draft should always be from the heart. It should be impulsive. Mm. I always refer to it as just like vomit on a page. Yeah. Just just expel the notion. And I always wait. I always wait for quite a while before I share it. I tend to write the first draft of anything pretty quickly. Mm. And I think of it as me taking the characters by the hand and then going, hmm, what would I like to see you do next? What is the most interesting option? What is going to be the most challenging option for you? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. Well, when you're writing, do you have sort of the the resources that you've got access to? Let's just say that's like the locations, maybe even actors that you know their style of and uh, maybe even props that you've got access to. Is that... Is that what you consider at the start of the writing process? Or do you sort of just write freely and then go, oh, I don't have access to that car or that location and then change I do, it? I do write freely and then I tend to shape and whittle and whatnot further down the track. Yeah. But I, I have found that I, because I have so many friends who are extraordinary actors, I often write with people in mind. Mm. Um, and that helps immensely in um, channeling interesting perspectives and shaping a character to their specific skill sets or interesting ways that they interpret text or information or what I know would trigger something for them in a positive mm. way, not a negative trigger. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So... I mean, for me, particularly with The Returned, the location is always an incredibly important character within the story. Mm. Um, In The Returned in particular, I am exploring architecture and memory. Um, So the film is largely shot in the family home where all the kids grew up. And so... Is that your family home too or do you No, find... no, it's not. Um, so that would have found... been nice, oh, maybe. <laughs> yes, no. Or maybe it would have brought too many, too many memories back. Potentially, but like we, it's, um, we just, we, we had a lot of incredibly positive, uh, uh, incredibly positive things that happened by um, a fluke of nature. Like we've, we've just found that, the film has good juju and (laughs) we've just stumbled across things that have fallen into place, which has been. Oh, that's amazing. Really beautiful. So we stumbled across this property. I found it on um, Airbnb. And so I wrote to this, this woman who owned this property. It's a 700 hectare farm in Wannon, which is 25 minutes out of um, Hamilton in regional Victoria. And it's a former sheep shearers shed. And uh, I just wrote to her and she sent me her number. She was like, oh, it's fine. Yeah, you can use it. And so she's she's giving us the farm. She was just really on board with the idea of a film being shot out there. Oh, um, nice. And has given us mates rates. And it was just a little bit of a, a snowball effect because then she 
passed on the contact details of the neighbours over the fence and it was that gorgeous thing of like country folk just wanting to help in whatever way they could. Yeah. So the people over the fence happened to own a former scout camp and had 25 individual cabins. Oh, my gosh. And so we ended up locking that in as our um, accommodation. And then the man who owned the scout camp was like, oh, my my wife, um, we have access to a commercial kitchen. Do you want some help with catering? And oh so my gosh. things just kept snowballing and it's just been, it's been absolutely amazing. So myself and the producer are now members of the local community Facebook page and anytime we need something, we just jump on Facebook and we do a little post and we just say, does anyone have any woolen blankets from the 1970s? And does wow. anyone have a crystal wind chime? And everyone jumps on board. It's just been really lovely in that regard. That's crazy. I love that. that that's that's so, so handy for you. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, sometimes it does come together. You know, it's the domino effect. And, Absolutely. And I think, I think if you if you treat like, you know, every opportunity with like open open eyes or whatever and like yes. in a good heart, I feel like things unlock for you like a lot easier. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, yes, in, in reference to what we were chatting about before, once I found that property, I went back and rewrote the script and I used aspects of the property itself. Because you knew like certain elements. And exactly. Yeah. And I knew the kind of the vista and the views and the setting and the location and the isolation. Mm. Um, and then the script changed again once we found that property because there's a little creek that runs along the bottom of this particular farm. That creek turns into the Wannon River, which turns into Wannon Falls, which is one of the most spectacular waterfalls in Australia. Wow. Um, it's actually a sinkhole and the waterfall formed within the sinkhole. So it's this extraordinary thing and I was like well I've got to write that into the story somehow yeah and so we have this moment where one of the characters climbs into the belly of the sinkhole and screams at the waterfall <laughs> that's um, amazing oh that would look so nice yeah it's I can beautiful just imagine that yeah oh um, so good so again I guess that's just kind of taking whatever is thrown at you and finding ways to stitch it into the story in meaningful ways that, you know, are uh, thematically woven into the fabric of the film. I love that. So now for an actor that's mm. potentially starting out, maybe, yeah. you know, has has those same sort of dreams and ambitions and probably has been auditioning for some time and just hasn't really gotten that next big break or that next role, mm -hmm. what would you sort of suggest to them so that they can get things moving because you were in that same position all those years back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say make work um, in whatever capacity you can make a short film for 200 bucks, shoot it on an iPhone, get all the lens attachments off eBay. Mm. Um, and I, I think the other really important thing is find your people, create a network like uh, being an artist and making films or theatre is meant to be entirely collaborative. It, you know, it's not the auteur, you know, with the singular vision who's just mm. going to scream until everyone delivers that. It's really not that at all. It has to be collaborative. And that that is the only way that you can make work that has integrity and is rich and informed, like investing in those relationships. So get a small crew together, even if it's only three people, yeah. make something on your iPhone and write something together, keep workshopping it. If you're not a confident writer, start by doing long form improvisation. Just rent a room, use someone's garage and start talking about ideas and you know, do long form improvisations that run for 20 minutes based off that and then use that content to structure a script and yeah. go from there and think about the sorts of roles that you might be cast in or that you want to be mm. cast in and create those characters. Yeah. Make I the content. I could have said that better. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. That was amazing. <laughs> um, I, I actually totally um, – 
when it, when it comes to actors, I think they totally should create the work that they would see themselves acting in in the future. Like if they if if all fell into their lap and like let's just say they wanted to be like an action movie star, they should try to make content that has that, those characters and they yeah. play those characters. There's sort of no, there, even though it's like nice creative flexibility, like if you if you are able to do all these different roles, I'd totally sort of suggest like making more in line with what you want long-term career-wise. So yeah. I think that that's great advice. And then let's go back to the topic of resourcefulness. Why mm-hmm. do you think it's really important for people to be resourceful rather than trying to go beyond their means? I think it's about discovering the uniqueness of your own voice. I often find if someone overshoots and tries to make work that is outside of their experience and uh, beyond what they have access to physically, I always find that there's something just lacking in the work. Um, There's an emptiness to it or audiences are looking at it and asking why. Mm. Why do we need to see this? Why was it made? Whereas um, hooking into resourcefulness and inventiveness and lateral thinking and, and problem solving, all those sorts of things, once you hook into that, you're able to create something that is uniquely yours um, that will undoubtedly resonate with audiences. Uh, Yeah. I love that. Ben, what have you got coming up? So you're working on The Return. Tell us a little bit more about that and then also where can people find you? Um, So uh, The Returned, yes, that's kind of – I just finished full-time work last week. So I've gone – Thank you. (laughs) <laughs> Holiday? Well, pre production, straight into it. I've dove, <laughs> dove, in, dove, dived into the deep end. Um, yeah, so I am in pre production now. I'm working with an incredible team um, on the returned, and it's kind of daily meetings and uh, like this. This has been a long time coming. Um, like I said before, this is my fifth screenplay. The others have had lives that are separate from me. Mm. But, um, yeah, this one, I, I just really wanted to make something where I could see the creative vision through from conception to script to finished product. I wanted that experience. Um, previous, previous experiences with some of the sort of development offerings from the government bodies Mm. in Australia haven't been incredibly positive experiences. Mm. Um, And, you know, I mean, as soon as the project gets to a certain size, you just had so many people putting their fingers in the pie yeah. And the pie just gets a bit sloppy. And <laughs> I, that's that that was kind of the the yeah. impetus to create this work and um I happened to just fall into line with a bunch of beautiful people who saw value in this particular production and um we're just going to make it. I um, love that. Where so can that, people follow it. Um the returned film at the returned film is our Insta handle. Um, I've got a Facebook page. It's just Ben Andrew Pfeiffer. Um, and yeah, same thing for my Insta handle. And I'll put all the links in the bottom. Thank you. Um, mind you, I only joined Instagram like four weeks ago. Um, really (laughs) late to the game. (laughs) Look at you joining the young ones. (laughs) I know, getting in there. Um, but yes, um, uh, nothing else in the pipeline yet. Uh, only oh, because there'll be more, I'm sure. There will be more. Um, my partner and I have been going through IVF and surrogacy internationally oh. and locally for the last six years. 
Oh, wow. And we are actually expecting twins in May. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> so it's going to be a big year. So, Oh, well, congratulations. Birthing a film and birthing our long-awaited babies. So that... That I, I'm that's, sure. I'm that's sure. That's beautiful. Yeah, it'll be amazing. So we've got uh, we we'll have little little twins running around, and I'm sure the journey of parenthood will bring up all sorts of things that will create new perspectives and um, insight, new stories. I love that, yeah. Ben. It's been absolutely wonderful talking to you. It's been just great. It's it's such an important conversation. We need to inspire actors and creatives just in general to just keep making stuff and Absolutely. To, to not be limited by what they have available to them. So again, thank you so much for, for joining, Ben. It was wonderful. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.